London, March 2012. When popular 29-year-old soap actress Gemma McCluskey goes missing, it's completely out of character. Following a nationwide appeal, her brother Tony receives a chilling phone call from a stranger claiming to have kidnapped Gemma with a ransom demand of two million pounds. Tony can't believe his luck. An alibi has fallen into his lap because he, and only he, knows that his sister Gemma is already dead. Hi, I'm Zoe and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification. I upload new true crime videos weekly and I'd love to share them with you. Today, we're going to the UK, more precisely London, where I hail from actually. And we're talking about the case of British soap actress, Gemma McCluskey. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. London's East End has always had a dark side. Famous for its immigrant populations, high levels of poverty, and of course, from 1888, Jack the Ripper. You might be mistaken for thinking it's a tight-knit community, full of cheeky Cockney Barrow boys, chimney sweeps, or flower girls, peppering their sales patter with rhyming slang. But underneath the stereotypical facade lies a grim history of overcrowding, poverty, violent crime and social unrest. This is the image of the East End that emerged in the Victorian era and it lingers on in the popular imagination today. Despite their seemingly hard lives, the original Cockneys, as East End Londoners became known, developed a tenacious spirit and a reputation for humour. Nowhere is this better demonstrated than in the playful distortion of the English language known as Cockney rhyming slang. Famous examples include apples and pears, meaning stairs, trouble and strife, meaning wife, and dog and bone, meaning phone. Well, you get the idea. In 1985, the BBC greenlit the introduction of a British soap opera called, you guessed it, EastEnders. And, well, it's been going ever since. For 35 years, the residents in the fictional borough of Walford in London's East End have played out their daily lives in front of millions of British households. One such character, introduced in the year 2000, was Kerry Skinner played by 17-year-old Gemma McCluskey. With this in mind, we fast forward to the night of March 3rd, 2012. Two men arrive at a police station in London's East End to report a missing person. They identify themselves as Tony and Danny McCluskey. They file a report saying that their sister, Gemma, has been missing for three days. The last person to see Gemma was her brother, Tony. In fact, the two of them lived together in nearby Shoreditch. He confirmed that she'd left the house on Thursday, hadn't said where she was going and hadn't come back since. This was unusual for her. She would definitely have let her family know if she'd had any plans to stay overnight elsewhere. Since it's only been two days, police aren't overly concerned initially. She is a 29-year-old woman. People leave and come back without telling family members sometimes. Um, there is no undue cause for concern. However, as hours continued to pass, there was a growing concern among friends and family that the situation just wasn't right. Gemma was an avid user of social media and it was extremely out of character for her to go completely silent for such a long period. Gemma McCluskey was born on the 5th of February, 1983. She grew up the youngest of three children in a working class family in London's East End. Her father was a builder and her mother gave up work 
to look after the children. They lived in Hackney, in an area that was considered fairly rough at that time, but like the surrounding area of Shoreditch, has undergone quite a dramatic facelift over the last 20 years and is considered very desirable now. Her parents divorced when she was young, but fortunately that didn't seem to affect Gemma in any adverse way. She remained confident, bubbly and loved to be the centre of attention. Small in stature, as an adult she was only 4 feet 11 inches tall, she had this engaging, larger-than-life personality. She was enrolled in drama school at the age of seven and excelled in acting. She caught her big break at 17, having auditioned for the producers of TV soap EastEnders and been offered what many considered a dream role. She appeared as Kerry Skinner over five months in about 30 episodes and was linked to quite a few of the main characters and featured in several key storylines. Here's a short clip for those of you unfamiliar with the soap. Gemma is the petite blonde on the left. Henry, I know you've been hiding from. Who do you think? I thought they'd given up by now. Yeah, but it's romantic, isn't it? No, it's a nightmare. Might be a nightmare for you, but I thought Darren was a bit of a right. Boy, you're supposed to be engaged. Yes, yeah, all right, all right. I'm only messing about. Anyway, me and Robbie have got hot dates tonight. Looks like Darren's come a long way for nothing. Gemma loved her role, but the world of TV, particularly Soapland, is fast-paced and her character Kerry was written out of the show only five months later, in February 2001. Now, obviously she was disappointed, but she still had dreams and ambitions of acting. Sadly, it seemed that she couldn't find any acting work, and so reluctantly, after a couple of years of trying, she decided to give up on acting. She found a job in a local pub, which it was said that she quite enjoyed. She also appreciated the time this change in lifestyle afforded her. She was able to meet more often with family and friends. At this time, she was living with her mother and brother Tony in a flat in Shoreditch. In late 2011, Gemma's mother, Pauline, was diagnosed with a brain tumour and she had to stay in the hospital for her treatment. To make matters worse, during her stay, she contracted an infection, which seriously prolonged her recovery period. Gemma took on all the responsibilities associated with care for her mother and visited her in the hospital daily. Now, six weeks after her mother had gone into hospital, Gemma had disappeared. And with each passing day, her family and friends began to fear the worst. A search was organised and people distributed missing posters all over London's East End. The press became interested as several actors from the soap EastEnders who had worked with Gemma joined the appeal and publicly requested that anyone with information about Gemma's whereabouts come forward. Friends told police that on that morning, before her disappearance, she'd gone to an event at the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. A new wing was being opened and her friend's daughter was singing in the choir there. One of the last photos of Gemma was taken by press attending the event. She's seen here in a yellow top, holding up her phone to record the choir singing. After five days, out of the blue, Gemma's older brother Tony was contacted by someone claiming to know exactly where Gemma was. He received a series of calls on the 6th of March where someone was purporting to have Gemma and was demanding a ransom for her return. In the first call, the instruction was to bring £2 million to Benfleet International Station if he wanted to see her alive again. On the second call, the kidnapper added that Tony should also bring $500 in Iraqi currency. Investigators were able to trace the call to an address 30 miles away in Kent. When officers arrived, Gemma wasn't there. It became apparent very quickly that the whole thing was just a cruel hoax. It was a 19-year-old man who had 
no connection with the case whatsoever. But it obviously wasted a huge amount of police time and resources. The man, Sam Dunn, said that he'd been drinking and smoking weed with his friends that day. They'd seen the missing posters online and thought, between them, they'd have a bit of a laugh and they'd call a number on the posters for a joke. He was prosecuted eventually and convicted of an offence under the Malicious Communications Act. Sam Dunn served a six-month prison sentence. Police immediately resumed their search for Gemma, but six days after her disappearance, the search was about to come to a tragic end. Police received a call about a suspicious object floating in Regent's Canal. A woman had come across a suitcase, and when it was retrieved, the spring lock popped open to reveal a truly horrific sight. It was the headless torso of a female and it was immediately suspected to be Gemma due to the fact that there was a distinctive butterfly tattoo at the base of the spine, which matched the description of one of her tattoos. The medical examiner confirmed through DNA tests that it was Gemma's body, and sadly, what had started as a missing persons case had now become a murder investigation. Her family and friends were obviously horrified not only did they have to deal with the fact that Gemma was gone, but that somehow she'd been murdered in the most gruesome way possible. The press headlines were sensationalist, and because of the TV connection and the nature of the discovery, it made national headlines for several days. Teams of police divers searched the canal for the rest of Gemma's body. Over the following days, they discovered Gemma's limbs disposed of in black plastic rubbish bags in four separate locations in that stretch of the canal. Unfortunately, Gemma's head could not be located, leading some people to theorise that whoever was responsible had been trying to conceal her identity. The pathology report confirmed that there were some bruises on the torso, but more shockingly, over 100 separate knife or axe wounds which had occurred some time after death. The police decided to re-examine, in detail, Gemma's movements on the day she disappeared. After she'd attended the function at the hospital in Whitechapel on the morning of March 1st, she visited her friend, Erica, at her house to show her the video she'd taken of her daughter singing in the choir. There were a few other friends there and Gemma stayed and had some drinks. Erica later told police that Gemma had seemed rather preoccupied, not quite her usual self, and when questioned, she said that she'd had a fight with her 35-year-old brother, Tony. Now you remember Gemma lived in a flat in Shoreditch with Tony and her mother Pauline. At this point in the story, Pauline had been in hospital for six weeks, recovering from her surgery. It's fair to say that Gemma and her brother Tony had had a contentious relationship for a long time. It started way back when she had begun to excel at school and in her drama studies and he was struggling. It was said that he was disruptive at school, he bullied others and was generally known as a bit of a troublemaker. He dropped out of school without any qualifications so he struggled to find a job. His father pulled some strings and he was offered several entry-level positions in building companies, things like that, but he never lasted long. He just had no interest in making any effort or in fact showing any appreciation for the opportunities presented to him. Eventually he found work as a part-time window cleaner. But the siblings' stark difference in terms of work ethic or lack of it, in Tony's case, wasn't the only bone of contention between the two. While Gemma was focused and driven, Tony was the opposite, spending his time at home on the sofa drinking and smoking weed. He smoked 15 joints a day, the house stank, and his drug habit caused constant arguments. Gemma's friends told police that 
rather than growing out of it, the older Tony got, the more of a negative impact his attitude and drug use seemed to have on their relationship. When compared with Gemma's relatively early successes, Tony was always viewed as a failure in comparison. But rather than get up off his backside and do something about it, he sat stewing with resentment and found solace in drink and drugs. It was suggested that after their mother was hospitalised and the only peacemaker was effectively out of the picture, tensions between the pair reached a new level. Gemma had to assume the responsible role, while Tony was just disinterested and argumentative. Police learnt from Gemma's friends that on the morning of March the 1st, the day she disappeared, she had mentioned an incident at home where Tony had left the taps on in the bathroom and flooded the whole house. This sort of thing wasn't a one-off incident. He acted pretty thoughtlessly a lot of the time. And as Gemma felt responsible for looking after things while her mother was away, she was obviously frustrated and upset. In fact, Tony rang her mobile phone while she was telling them the story and he was shouting at her so loudly that her friends could all hear him through the phone. Gemma reacted by telling him to pack his bags and leave the flat, that he'd better be gone by the time she got home. Her friends were a bit concerned for her safety. She would have bruises on her arms from time to time and occasionally even felt the need to wear dark glasses. She admitted to them that Tony was sometimes physically abusive. Nevertheless, she left her friend's house at 1pm that afternoon and returned home. The police investigators' suspicions were growing, but they didn't have any evidence. They obtained a search warrant for the McCluskey home, hoping to find some evidence linking Tony to the crime. They found a knife in the kitchen with traces of blood on it, and similarly, in the bathroom, they found a couple of small blood spots that turn out to be Gemma's, but it's not significant enough to be out of the ordinary. Furthermore, forensic investigators don't find any indication of a clean-up operation either, nothing initially to indicate that anything untoward had taken place there. In addition, Tony had behaved in a manner deemed fitting for the situation. He had assisted police with inquiries, reported Gemma missing, and even admitted that he was the last person to see Gemma alive when working through the timeline with police. His actions and behaviour so far certainly hadn't given the authorities any undue cause for concern. By checking his phone, police could see that he'd sent a message to his sister the morning after her disappearance. In it, he'd confirmed that he'd visited their mother in hospital and checked in on her. He'd signed off, love ya. And this was something that caught people's attention because that wasn't how he usually spoke to her. At all. P Police tried a different tack. They went door to door, asking the McCluskey's neighbours what they thought about Tony. It transpired that Tony's use of skunk cannabis was known not only to his friends, but to a lot of people in the local area. I'm told it's not my area of expertise, but in the USA, skunkweed just refers to a strain of marijuana that has a very strong smell. But in the UK, skunkweed refers to something with a really high THC level, so it's extremely potent. Tony's background checks brought up a couple of previous arrests one for low-level violence and also a drug possession. When the family were questioned, Gemma's father mentioned one incident where Tony had placed his hands on Gemma's throat during an argument, and there existed documentation from her mother, Pauline, dating back seven years, asking the council to rehome Tony urgently because his outbursts had become too unmanageable. In light of these findings, investigators look at the texts from Tony to Gemma in a new way. They obtain the right to search his phone history, his phone records, texts, GPS data, 
to pin down his precise movements. They also discover several inconsistencies when speaking to friends about when they say he told them he last saw Gemma. Also, it was noted that he had sustained some sort of injury to his hand in the days before reporting the disappearance. You can see a bandage in some of the photos. And he'd given friends and family varying explanations as to how that happened. It's enough to make Tony the police's prime suspect. However, they still don't have any solid proof to charge him. It's become such a high-profile case that it's impossible to make a move without sufficient evidence. They decide to arrest him, perhaps hoping that he'll give something away. But he asserts his right to remain silent. His demeanour changes. He closes up, answering every question with no comment. While the police questioned him, the investigation continued. Detectives came back to the text he sent Gemma on the morning she disappeared. They could see by going through the records that he's never signed off love ya or any sort of affectionate phrase before. Conversely, many of the other texts to her were aggressive in tone. It seemed more and more likely that this was a calculated attempt to cover his tracks should the police ever decide to look more closely at him. Phone records also showed that Tony had called a minicab service and ordered a taxi to the house on the evening of the 2nd of March, the day after Gemma's disappearance. When the driver arrived, Tony had a large suitcase with him. I mean, heavy. He struggled to manoeuvre it. When the driver inquired what was inside, Tony said it was a stereo system. The driver told police that he dropped Tony off at Dunstan Road, a location right beside the canal where Gemma's torso was later recovered. Police immediately seized the taxi and traces of Gemma's blood are found in the trunk. Footage from the CCTV cameras in the location where Tony was dropped off were reviewed. This was in fact the break that the police had needed up until this point, they'd collected hours of footage along the substantial length of the canal in order to see if whoever had dumped Gemma's body had been caught on camera. Now they had a location and a time to narrow down the search. They captured the moment Tony was dropped off by the taxi. And also a grainy image of a man dragging a heavy suitcase along the street on a different camera. Later, Tony is filmed again, this time without the suitcase. Investigators assert that it's likely Gemma was killed shortly after arriving back from her friend's house in the afternoon of March the 1st. The siblings had a heated argument which ultimately resulted in Gemma's death. The fact that Tony removed Gemma's body in a suitcase the next evening suggests that he dismembered his sister in the house. We already know forensics discovered virtually no traces of blood, even after they sprayed luminol and investigated thoroughly. And this means that Tony took extraordinary precautions, planning the disposal of his sister's body, perhaps using plastic sheeting to limit the contamination of the crime scene. The post-mortem report from the pathologist concluded that it had taken considerably more effort to remove the first two limbs than the rest. It's been suggested that this supports the theory that Tony started off using a knife like the one found in the kitchen downstairs before progressing to an axe or a hatchet. On the 10th of March 2012, Tony McCluskey was formally charged with Gemma's murder. They had significant evidence against him but the one thing they lacked was a conclusive cause of death and there were concerns that this might impact the results in a trial. However, on December the 9th, detectives would finally be able to put the last pieces of the puzzle into place. Volunteers working on a clean-up operation in another area of the canal made a shocking discovery inside a black bin bag fished from the water. 
It was Gemma's head. The forensic examination of her skull confirmed that she was beaten to death, struck twice with a heavy, blunt object. The trial began on the 14th of January 2013 and Tony pleaded not guilty. Interestingly, rather than proclaim his innocence, the defence argued that he should be convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Tony stated that after Gemma arrived home, an argument ensued, which escalated with her coming at him with a knife. He maintained that he pushed her to the ground in self-defence, and from that moment on, his memory blacked out. Prosecution ripped apart his claims, arguing that it wasn't just a momentary loss of control. He went to extraordinary lengths to cover up the crime and conceal the evidence, demonstrating that he was in control of his actions and knew exactly what he was doing. The jury agreed, and on the 30th of January, Tony was found guilty of Gemma's murder and sentenced to a minimum term of 20 years in prison. Obviously, Gemma's remaining family, her parents and other brother, Danny, were shocked and heartbroken. It was almost inconceivable that this could be the reality. Initially, Anthony McCluskey, Gemma's father, was desperate to maintain some sort of contact with Tony. He'd lost his daughter under horrific circumstances and he was looking for some kind of sign of remorse from Tony so that the family could begin to perhaps forgive and start to move forward with their lives. However, after five years and no sign from Tony that he felt any inkling of guilt or remorse for his actions, Anthony McCluskey turned his back on his son for the last time. Less than a year after her son was convicted of murdering her daughter, Pauline McCluskey lost her battle with cancer. Relatives said she died of a broken heart. As was her final wish, she was laid to rest with a handful of Gemma's ashes beside her. And that's the conclusion of today's case. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you so much for watching. If you found this case interesting, please do take a moment to hit the subscribe button below and ring the notification bell. Also, thank you for the very complimentary and encouraging comments I've been receiving over the last couple of weeks. I really do appreciate every single one. And I guess, all that remains to be said is take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.